Hello everyone, welcome to I is Simplified. I is Simplified is an, I, is an RPA Dragon Busters podcast series where we showcase industry leaders to actually discuss intelligent automation and its impact on SME, our mid-market financial services, healthcare and other related fields. I'm your host, Taran Jaitikala. And on today's episode, we'll be discussing something quite interesting. And this is discuss- this is building an intelligent document processing business case as a mid-sized business. And on today's episode, I'm actually joined by Kale Reuter, the founder of DigiSalix. Before we crack on with the episode, I want to welcome you to I Simplified. And please tell us a little bit about yourself. Thanks, Tony. It's an honor to be here. Uh, so I'm Kale Reuter. Uh, founder of DigiSolix. Um, I started my career in software uh, roughly 20 years ago doing hardware-oriented computer graphics programming, so fairly involved global of stuff. Um, then I ended up diversifying from there to project management, uh, being a CEO of a company called Draw Elements, uh, which actually got sold to Google, um, and I spent three years at Google after uh, that. Um, Following that, uh, I moved more into AI and productizing the new technology for use in Office. Uh, and I founded DigiSalix two years ago to help people to be more productive at the office uh, by teaching computers to read better. So the idea is that people don't have to type in as much stuff when computers can actually read it for you. So intelligent document automation. And I seem to like uh, working at the intersection of technology and people. So it's uh, having these discussions, uh, improving people's lives <laughs> uh, is what makes me tick in addition to kind of creating new technology. In terms of how we're going to probably structure our conversation, I'm actually thinking of structuring it around six key areas. I think to make us, you know, much more structured and obviously not, you know, engage engage a lot as well so the fourth section of it will be discussing the you know if we'll be defining the business problem and outcome and the second part would be choosing the right technology solution then we'll talk talk about costing as well as time scales expected roi and risk but before i before we delve you know into all of this can you tell me a little bit about teaching machines reading comprehension what's that all about you mentioned optical character recognition um, so that's just a beginning of the process. It's kind of like five year old reading letter by letter uh, and being able to copy that. So it's the computer can extract from a scanned image that these are the letters that are in this position. But that doesn't tell much about the actual meaning of the information. What is what this you see that you have a number, but you don't know whether it's a total sum or line item tax before you actually structure the information. And that part is the new technology where you give meaning to parts of the document. And then it becomes also easier to automate and store into the database. So with the invoice, you now you can extract the information that the total sum of the invoice is one, two, three, four pounds, for example. And then it's very easy to uh, implement computer programs around that information once you find it. Then moving on to defining a business problem and outcome, how do you think businesses can you know, go about defining a business problem that would justify spending um, a lot of money on IDP? Yeah, there's uh, plenty of factors to consider. That's true. Um, um, well, of course, you first need to find a process where there are lots of PDF or paper documents involved. Um, then you need to consider uh, the type of document. So uh, invoices, receipts, uh, purchase orders, um, real estate documentation describing apartments, all these usually have like these clear fields and repetitive information that you can extract. Um, and it's clear task to find a piece of information from the document and give it to the for, for further processing. Um, the counter example of that is that if, for example, your company is receiving purchase orders that are basically emails going, hi Tolani, I would like the usual, your skull. 
you can understand that there's not really information to be extracted from the document. It's all contextual, all in the uh, heads of the sales representatives, uh, like the important bits. So you need to be a bit careful, like what kind of documents you can automate really. Um, but once you bypass that barrier, then it's more about figuring out really how many documents there are per year, how many minutes it takes to uh, process each document. And then you can build kind of like a work effort saving uh, ROI computations, which is usually like how you justify the things. Of course, there are additional benefits of using automation, which are uh, happier workforce if they have less menial tasks to work on. Um, for example, um, I've heard that uh, highly paid uh, medical researchers need to spend some time every day going through these PDF documents over uh, arriving or email, which describe uh, findings from drug trials. And it sounded fairly <laughs> bad use of their time. And apparently the employees are also hating it <laughs> severely. So there are also other benefits than just saving the time. But they are, well, of course, hard to translate into euros, for example. They're still talking about the um, identifying the business problem and outcome. Often at times when we talk about the outcomes, people often want to justify it to say, for example, there's going to be 75% in claims processing. There's going to be 75% in you know, whatever savings. And I, if, I think more recently I started talking about sometimes even saving 10, 15 software licenses, also a savings as well. You know, mm. saving, you know, all this is that would have warranted us paying, but we can save them through automation. Either with one license that we are automating against one license, it's a whole lot of achievement. And let's talk about some of these, some of these outcomes. How do people actually define some of these outcomes and tie this with their business problem? You mentioned the basic approach of translating the work of uh, humans uh, through salaries to euros. Uh, there could be other um, approaches or ways to leverage the IDP. Um, one uh, crucial change between humans processing the documents and automated processing is the delay. So if you need to have humans processing the documents, the process may have this like a 24 hour delay waiting for a, a customer representative to review the information. But if you can actually process it automatically, you can uh, build these service pipes where you read the document, extract the information, maybe ask the client, is this correct? And then off you go with automatic processing. If the business problem by itself is easily transcribed in logic, like oh, for RPA, for example. And that's kind of like a, maybe something that people don't think so actively. They just think about like reducing the work, but sometimes, uh, transforming how the process is done is actually more critical. Coming from the RPA side, things more, I think it's it's easier, if you ask me, I might be wrong, I think it's easier to identify some opportunities for IDP. Because if you've automated rule-based automation, you you know the cons and you know the pros. And mm -hmm. that's why you know that there's, there are gaps just in terms of end-to-end -end flow. It, it's really, um, if like, uh, if you take a really RPA look at the world and the processes, you are looking for these pieces of process that you can automate, make faster uh, using the RPA tools. And maybe if you come from the IDP perspective, you think more about having a tool for the people uh, to help them accomplish the kind of like the larger task. Uh, and to me, that's really kind of like a powerful viewpoint in a sense. I, I think that that helps to design uh, solutions that are truly helping people and not trying to kind of like optimize parts of the process as such. And um, that also think, uh, changes a bit like how you think about the problem. For example, we did this trial with a bank uh, where and we um, 
have these like three to five page real estate documents with varying layouts, etc. Fairly complex information. And the transcribing that information from the documents to the system takes roughly 15 minutes. By transforming that into uh, checking and maybe error correcting uh, reduces the effort to roughly three minutes per document. So it's 80% saving in the time without kind of like doing 100% automation necessarily, but you can leverage the automation to handle like 50 or 80% of the documents and then having a human just quickly run through the to verify the results. But there's so many, there's a variety of IDP solutions on the market. People offering, let's say, practical solutions that could be catered, let's say, to financial services. You've talked about um, real estate as well. And there's some of the vendors that are kind of just focused around, you know, real estate and some of the other areas, pharmaceuticals and all that. And just judging by that, you know, what really informs that decision for companies to go for, you know, vertical solutions provider or they just go for a very generic provider? Um, so I, there you may need to think a bit strategically about the problem uh, in the sense that um, let's say the company is a bit smaller and you have a specific problem like you, know, you have to deal with uh, PDF and paper invoices. Then the question comes whether you need a better vertical accounts payable solution or do you really need to go into building your own around uh, IDP. Uh, I've seen successful cases where there is sufficient technical capability to actually combine the IDP and to access the you know, various sub local subsystems. But that requires that you have some technical competence for doing it. And the other area where you may want to uh, go into actually leveraging IDP yourself uh, is um, that you plan to take this, uh, the information from this one type of document and use it in multiple places. So for example, the real estate document in a bank, it can serve uh, lending like mortgage applications. It can serve real estate agents uh, that work with the bank. It can serve uh, statistics gathered for building portfolios around uh, apartments or other real estate. There you have the same, maybe same document serving at least three different kinds of use cases. Then it might make sense to operate the IDP yourself. Some documents actually serve you know, multiple purposes. One thing that comes to mind would usually be your IDNVs, your identification and verification document. They're usually the same for, for most of the cases. If you wanted to apply for, for example, if you wanted to apply for a driver's license, you would need to show a proof of identification. And normally it could be your passport, for example. And if you wanted to apply for a new bank account, you need to show your passport as well. If you want to apply for a couple of things, everything is really tied to your identification documents. And, and I think it's very important for companies to actually think that, you know, how can their solution be flexible to enable, you know, enable it to serve for different, you know, different use cases. I think that's a very interesting point. And let's move on to costing. I think this is what a lot of people want to hear about. I think the most important thing uh, is always to send me a business case. The first thing I look at is the cost. Mm -hmm. I, I would always say I, I'm not going to make you happy all the time. I can only make you happy within a reasonable <laughs> cost. <laughs> so the costing is obviously quite crucial. And I think this is what why a lot of companies shy away from, you know, ITP solutions or they shy away from other technologies as well. Then when we look at the costing, who pays for IDP? Is it IT that pays for IDP? Is it the CIO, the business users, who pays for the IDP solution? Uh, so kind of like two, um, two sections, kind of like the, uh, the costing and then like who actually uh, puts the bill. Um, so, I tend to start like the cost estimation from setup costs and then uh, uh, per document processing fee because that's scalable and kind of uh, puts the um, that's like the, the real uh, payments into the um, 
actual usage or production use. Um, in my experience, the setup uh, is something between 10 to 20,000 euros in, let's say, normal cases. Um, and then, the, well, the document fees depend on complexity of the task and uh, how good quality OCR is used and uh, whether the service is um, maintained in the Salix cloud or the customer private cloud, which is totally possible. Um, so there's various factors there, but it has to be reasonable and that the per document fee is usually what fuels the error where I computation. So mm -hmm. I guess people get some, some idea of like how much <laughs> is reasonable from there. I, so um, what else? Then like if uh, you want to talk about more about like who should foot the bill, I think that's really complicated question. Uh, it's always for the corporation a bit of a problem whose budget is being used now, or as, at least as long as I understand the problem. Um, and in this case, for all new technologies, basically, the uh, for business units, trying out something new is away from their budget and especially away from their precious time. So they are probably hesitant to try new things. Whereas uh, R&D department or IT CIO, those functions may have more this kind of like a forward looking uh, attitude or risk taking attitude. And it might be that you actually need a mix here so that the uh, people wanting to do the trials, they probably should have budget and a mandate to build these like one year production trials from scratch until production. And then the business gets to decide at that point whether they actually want the system or not. Um, and then they can kind of like take up the bills from there on. And once in the, once you have in the company these success stories where IT came in, offered a good solution, business liked it and uh, took it, then it's easier maybe for other business units to follow suit if needed, or build ad additional uh, success cases in the same business unit. But um, like if the CEO wants to see these things uh, taken into use, there should be like this clear budget and mandate to do all the way to production trials, because it's, it's very hard to sell that concept by doing like a quick POC or demo and then going to the business unit and say that, okay, we, we'd like to have this much money to actually put it in production. Because I think the business units have a bit of difficulty imagining how the solution will actually improve their lives before they see it in production. Very tricky question I knew up front. Because even with the automation side, you know, OK's automation can be very, very tricky and it can look different across, you know, organizations. I've seen some organizations being, you know, funding that from the CIO level. There's a budget that comes mm. from the CIO every year for automation. And I've seen in other places where the businesses actually, the business units actually pull resources. They fund it, you know, in different halves. And that pays for, let's say, the developers, the technology, you know, the building, testing, all of that. So there's quite there's quite a lot of dynamics. And I think this might vary, you know, across different organizations, which is quite interesting. And another interesting point you mentioned as well is it also depends on, you know, the kind of solution you're looking for. Most of the vendors I know are very keen to offer you cloud solutions, very keen. Mm -hmm. they you have access to you know GPU. You have access to more resource power. You can scale up as you know as much as you can. But in the financial services, very very rigid. They want to run on prem. Mm -hmm. yeah. What's your experience with that? Yeah. So um, we designed this our system to be what I've called IT architecture friendly. So we have fairly little dependencies. So referring back to the bank case that with the real estate documents, we were actually able to do it so that we kept all the data in the customer's private cloud all the time and do the setup and all the kind of like the document analysis and configuration work there. 
and it's basically just a fairly usual uh, AVS node that was running the service. So that's something that I think that is fairly unique, actually, the biggest Alex service that we can run basically everywhere. Uh, running even disconnected from the internet would be possible with maybe certain um, uh, trade-offs in the OCR quality. Let's talk about some of the time scales. From my experience, when AI is involved, there's a lot of uncertainty. It's very hard sometimes to determine the time scales. Mm -hmm. And also it's just because um, a lot of organizations are really stuck at the experimentation phase. I've seen some organizations that would tell you that if they can't achieve 95% accuracy, they won't be going to production. But how long do you think it should take just from you know this, making a decision to say, this is the vendor we're going to work with down to releasing just our first proof of concept into production? It's a tricky question. Just have a think. <laughs> it's like, uh, well, I can, for the sake of discussion, I can simplify it to <laughs> some numbers. Uh, like once you have um, the vendors selected, uh, I'd say it's roughly three months to first like real production use minimum um, with the assumption that you are spending maybe four weeks getting the paperwork sorted out and you kind of the absolute minimum time to set up the uh, infrastructure is probably four weeks and then you are doing four weeks of kind of like a initial trials and uh, for DigiSelects during that kind of like mid four weeks, uh, we'd be annotating documents and configuring the system and training it, et cetera. So thinking up in the chosen cloud uh, providers and those chosen nodes. Um, of course, if you are using Google, you know, Microsoft or Amazon Cloud to process invoices or something, then it's probably somewhat shorter, maybe four weeks from kind of like just starting the project and doing it basically yourself, like automating the invoice processing around those services. But if you have anything like custom that we do, then yeah, three months is probably absolute minimum. Three months on, on average, I think any business would be able to work for three months. And I feel sometimes when I, I, I go online and you see some people really talking about, oh, they can deliver this in a week, right? We both know that's not feasible because you've done, what you've done basically is you've done proof of concept, which if, if any, you can do that within a week, but you haven't really productionized that proof of concept. Before that gets into production, he has to look at it look he has to look in a particular way, which might definitely be different from how it was originally built because you wanted to have some bit of standards and all that. So I think it's very important where people are very transparent about how long it would take at a minimum. And I, I think just coming to the time scale, the coming to the time scale, I think also, I think I'd assume that there's a lot of dependencies because I know that you believe in things like, you know, annotating documents should be done by professionals, right? Mm -hmm. As opposed to, let's say, a citizen developer in that scenario. So I believe that, you know, depending on, because of that level of experience, it might actually be much more faster annotation document uh, as opposed to, you know, getting someone up upskilling them and all that can you touch on that a little bit yeah so this is something we've kind of like i've got gathered from other ai type of solutions as well i can say that trying to have uh as you call citizen developers or actual end users of the technology teach ai or do some sort of like annotation it has two problems one is that they don't, like the end users don't want to do it it's new task for them who wants more work, especially when you're basically changing the typing work to another type of menial work where you're just point and clicking things on the documents. Uh, the second part is that it's actually fairly tricky to know what you should be annotating to give the computer exactly correct uh, uh, hints or uh, information. So we were running this one trial on receipts and we were looking at how well the receipts actually matched 
the accounting database for the expenses. And I think we found out that roughly 50% were correct and rest were somehow not exactly what's on the receipt. And there's good reasons for it. In accounting, you might want to only uh, handle part of the receipt as part of the expense. And after that, the accounting information is basically unusable as an annotation for reading the receipt. Does it make sense? Well, it does. Um, you've just done a very great job at ex explaining this technically. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sure our, our listeners will be able to understand. And I think there was, there was another podcast. Uh, I had a, another podcast session. I recorded a podcast session with another guy um, from uh, another IDP provider. And he, I can remember him saying, you know, his advice is for companies looking to annotate documents is never use interns. <laughs> 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 it, was, it was like because the way I, I, why I kind of got it is like if you're ready to make rubbish out of your annotation process, just you know pushing interns because sometimes they don't really understand the they don't really understand the not I wouldn't say the knowledge behind it, but sometimes they don't really know why they're doing something right because they've been given the job. It's for them it's mundane as well. So for them it's almost like. They don't really sometimes they might not do a good job without you know oversight and all that but i know i know he said it but the way i kind of just took it was like you know being very blunt about the whole thing which is which is interesting sometimes how people see things then let's talk about roi you know roi is a killer for any automation program whether it be in you know erp system or whatever the case might be and i think this is what a lot of companies are you know dealing with where they forecasted the return on, of, on investment to be you know x amount of um, euros and they are actually getting way less than that for example and this is them going you know one or two years into the old automation program and but why why, why is this the case is it how how would they achieve this expedited roi in your opinion how can they achieve it um so uh, i did some like Let's call it back in the back of the envelope the um, calculations, uh, and kind of like the covering the setup costs uh, is roughly takes like twenty to fifty thousand documents, depending of course on the pricing. But it's kind of like a, a realistic numbers add up to roughly that. Uh, that of course doesn't uh, include any of the let's say additional benefits of better workforce morale, et cetera. It was just based on the pure salaries. Um, but it, yeah, it's um, for smaller businesses, that's uh, surprisingly many documents. Um, so it's not all document flows that reach kind of like a tens of thousands of documents per year. And yeah, at that point, you are reaching ROI fairly quickly, actually, once you have that like proper flows. Accounts payable companies can be going through millions of invoices per year. So there is kind of like a clear business case for uh, better automation. That's interesting. Um, there was a research, I can't remember what the name of the company was, but this research was done good years ago. It could probably be, uh, I know it wasn't recent, it's probably almost five years now, right? That research. And they estimated the number, I think they'd surveyed a couple of businesses and asked them, you know, on average, how many invoices did they process? So a lot of small, you know, they need small, medium would process in between five to like, you know, some of them are processing between five to like 10K um, documents. So I don't even know. I can't really tell if it was pages or if it was you know actual document. So they were processing around let's say five five to ten k um, pages of document or pages or receipt invoices or whatever the case might be. And large enterprises were going beyond let's say fifty and all of that. Obviously they had structures around them. So I believe. So what you're telling me is, the more documents you have, the more it justifies your expected ROI. Yes. Right? Okay. Yes. I mean the 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 higher amount of documents 
per year or month you have, the faster you'll get your money back. That That's the gist. Okay, it probably makes sense because when I think about from a different perspective, imagine spending these tons of euros on you know, just setting up the IDP solution. Let's say you set it up on prem, you got, let's say, experienced um, developers to do annotation or data annotators, and you got different people, right? And you're even building a center of excellence. That's going to cost a lot if your, your throughput is really low. In fairness, your throughput needs to be high to be able to justify the cost. And the investment you've made i think that makes a lot of sense when i think about it in that way i think it's been kind of brings us to another question and this has some of the risk when we talk about risk a different kind of risk one is you can look at it from the financial risk and we've kind of just touched on the financial risk a little bit and that financial risk is you know your investment you've invested but you are not getting any returns on your investment you now what other kind of risk can you see that you know people employing IDP might be facing? To avoid um, like miss uh, specifying the problem, uh, both the uh, customer and the solution provider need to understand the human process that's built around the documents. So what the uh, humans actually want to retrieve from the documents and how it's uh, used downstream in the process. Um, because that will prevent uh, silly uh, misconceptions and uh, mishaps uh, in the pro uh, in the setup. Um, then, uh, if the expectation is that it's basically infallible or very high uh, automated throughput, then you might get disappointed, and the system might be built on the wrong assumptions. If you start from the assumption that it can pro, uh, process, for example, 60 or 70% of the documents automatically, people will do the rest. Then you have, you, then you are kind of better equipped and prepared for taking advantage of what you have and improving it over time. But if you have like this expectation that you will automate all the documents completely independently from day one, you're probably going to spend a lot of time uh, setting up and configuring the system and you might not reach your unrealistic goals ever. And then you basically waste a lot of money there. Those are, quite, I'd say, like the main two risk factors, like know your process in wide sense and also be prepared to take what you get in a sense and plan the process so that you get benefits, even if the it's not 100 percent accurate is there anything you'd like to add on the list i think it's in terms of implementation there's risk i could call it people risk as well mm -hmm. in the in fairness where knowledge has been lost um and it, it's a risk to the old solution as well when people move jobs it's like no one really knows what's happening or how to operate the software or no one really knows what what let's say for example no one really knows where how the documents are generated, where if they're upstream, downstream. I think I think that's something that comes to mind when I think about um, risk as well. But I, I think we've talked about you know the major the major risk, which is quite interesting. I wanted to touch a little bit on Digitalix. I wanted to understand you know what you guys are doing, you know, just as a product company. So Digitalix teaches computers to read better, so that the humans don't need to type as much. Uh, what we are building is can be seen as a layer on top of optical character recognition that distills the meaning out of the documents. Uh, so we have, uh, let's say, three layers in the in our own system, which is first is the kind of toolkit that contains all the difficult machine learning and configuration tools. Then we have the layer that describes the per document type. So invoices, real estate document, this, that purchase order. And on top of that, there's a standardized um, server architecture that serves the data, receives the document, runs the interpretation, stores the results, etc. And next to it is our own annotation tool where you can mark the kind of like the interesting bits on the documents. And that's something that we 
develop more or less for ourselves, but welcome customers to use if they want to use to review the results. But yeah, so we are utilizing AI machine learning in, I'd say, in measured <laughs> uh, amounts. Uh, and we try to keep the amount of data or the number of uh, example documents needed to set up the system as low as possible, going in low hundreds, basically. Are you getting customers that are already using RPI and they want to you know, merge them together? Or are, are your customers just looking at IDP as a standalone solution? The RPA is expected to be really uh, low cost and nimble. And adding the cost of IDP to it is makes it a bit hard equation, especially for new customers. So I think the IDP as a technology needs to be proven in high volume automation use cases first before it kind of like gravitates more into RPA use. This leads us to the second to the last question, because I think we're running out of time. And the second to the last question is your advice. What's your advice for you know mid-sized business looking to invest in intelligent document processing in the next 12 months? Do your homework. So collect the preliminaries, understand what's in the documents, what needs to be read from them, how many you have, etc. Talk to multiple vendors, understand the differences, for example, in privacy and um, deployment options, uh, platform versus point solution, uh, in addition of the price. Uh, given the pricing hints given by the cloud uh, giants, I'd say whatever price you get, you'll probably get ROI in reasonable time if you have like a sizable uh, amount of documents going through your hands per year. But like the the other things are, I'm sorry, the things that will get you. And also uh, remember that getting the sample documents might be difficult even if you're running through tens of thousands per year. It might be that they arrive into people's email boxes and are lost after you that transcribe them into database. So there are all sorts of these kind of get with nuances in setting up. How can people reach out to you? So uh, LinkedIn is a nice way. Uh, Carl Ryder, you can find me or through the DigiSikes page. And also, if you like, you can email me directly at Carl at digisalix.fi, like finance. So, or follow us the DigiSelix page on LinkedIn to get the kind of like, uh, opinions and news from us. And thanks for coming to on I Simplify. It was really lovely to have you here. A Friday evening, a good time to wrap up for the evening. So I will be posting the transcription online. So this is going to be available on my website, rpajagonbuster.com. Then it's also going to be more some snippets of the video that will be available on social media like Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and some other platforms as well. So do keep an eye for you know, for this as well. You know, those shots in the bit and the full video will be going on LinkedIn Live. So we'll be looking forward to airing this session. So it'll be very interesting and lovely to get your feedback as well. Then if you're looking for someone to talk to about intelligent automation for small and mid-sized businesses or mid-markets for deployment delivery, feel free to send me an email at info at opiajagonbuster.com or go onto the website and that would also get me an email as well. But until next time, stay informed.